we are next going to look at the situation where we have a set of explanatory variables that we would like to relate to our multi-category response variable. The way that we do that is through the use of regression models. Now there are two main types of regression models that are used with a multi-category response. The first type involves a multi-category response that is nominal, meaning that category 2 is not greater than 1, category 1 that is, or let's say category 5 is not greater than category 3 and so on. Another type of uh, regression model uh, that's used with multi-category responses though does take into account or can take into account the ordering that may occur with a multi-category response like a multi-category response measured on a Likert scale. In that particular case, let's say category 2 would be greater than category 1 in some way. We will talk about those kinds of models later. Right now we're going to focus on the regression model, a type of regression model that's used when we have a nominal response variable. Okay, so again, suppose we have capital J different categories to our multi-category response and each of the corresponding categories has a certain probability associated with it. We want to estimate that probability given our explanatory variables. So to do this, we're going to form what are called baseline category logits. The word baseline comes into play because we're going to compare each of these categories to, I'm sorry, each of these probabilities to one another. We're going to compare them. And the way that we're going to do is we're going to compare, in our case, category, we're going to compare pi sub 2 to pi sub 1. We're going to compare pi sub 3 to pi sub 1. We're going to compare pi sub capital J to pi sub 1 so that the baseline category for us is going to be category 1. And the reason why we have the logit name in there is because notice how when we make this comparison we are dividing these probabilities and we're using a log transformation with it. This is very similar to what we had with a logistic regression model. So for example if we did have just two categories what we're going to be doing here actually simplifies exactly down to what we had when we had a logistic regression model. Okay, so to make things simple, let's suppose that we have just one explanatory variable for now. Then we can look at what's called a multinomial regression model that's formed as like this. On the left side, we have these baseline category logits. Now again, since we're comparing to category 1, this J here has to be at least 2 for the second category. And similar to what we saw with the logistic regression model, now we're going to have a linear combination of the regression parameters with our explanatory variables. In this case, we just have one explanatory variable. What makes this a little bit different from what we've seen before, now we need a subscript J here with our regression parameters. So for example, what this means is, is I could have my model log of pi 2 given pi 1, I'm sorry, log of pi, log of pi sub 2 divided by pi sub 1 is equal to beta 2, 0 plus beta 2, 1 times x. My model is also log of pi 3 divided by pi 1 is equal to beta 3 0 plus beta 3 1 times x. And I could keep on going down to the last category, category j, writing this out as well. And this all forms my model, all of this. Okay. Now you might be wondering, well that's great, we can compare to category 1. Well what if though I want to compare maybe category 3 to category 2? Well this model allows you to do that. We just don't immediately see our betas and our x then uh, stated in that way. 
but we can easily get to that format as well. So let's say that I want to compare category three to category two. What I could do is as follows. Suppose I write out the log of pi sub two divided by pi sub one, and I subtract the log of pi sub three divided by pi sub one. Okay, so I have two baseline category logits where I have a pi sub one there as that corresponding to that baseline category. Then, using properties of logarithms, I have log of pi sub two minus log of pi sub one. That quantity, subtract off log of pi sub three minus log of pi sub one. Look what happens. These two pi sub ones cancel out. I'm left with log of pi sub two minus the log of pi sub three. Combine them using again properties of logarithms. Now I get log of pi sub two divided by pi sub three. So I guess the way I ended up writing this out was that now pi sub three is, <clears throat> is the baseline category. Um, if you wanted to continue that then with all the other comparisons that were being made. Now, what happens to the right side of the model? Well, I write out the two right sides of the models. If I had log of pi sub two divided by pi sub one minus log of pi sub three divided by pi sub one. I do a little bit of a simplification. So now I have a new intercept term, you could say. And then here's my new slope parameter on x. And so it, in the end, it doesn't matter what you use for your baseline category. You just have to be consistent. I chose the first category because this is what R will choose as its baseline category. If we have more than one explanatory variable, well, you can guess what's going to happen here. We just continue adding terms to our corresponding model. Now, with this formulation of our model, what exactly is pi sub j? Probability that y is equal to j. Well, to find this, we have to do a little bit of algebra. Let's consider the case again where we have only one explanatory variable. And so what we can do is I can come back to my model here. Let me do a little bit of erasing. What we can do is suppose I use the exponential function on both sides of this model. So I have pi sub j divided by pi sub 1 is equal to the exponential function evaluated at beta j0 plus beta j1 times x. Okay. Then I could bring this pi sub 1 over to the right side. And that's what I do here. Okay. Now, remember that pi 1 plus pi 2 plus all the way up to pi sub uh, capital J has to e, uh, add up to 1 because you have to be in one of the capital J different categories. So what I can do then is write, write out this expression then in terms of my model. So I have pi 1 plus pi 2 corresponding to this right here using my equation up there, plus, and I keep on going down to pi sub capital J, again, using this expression above. Now notice what every equation has in common. It has a pi sub one, or I'm sorry, notice what every term has in common. It has a pi sub one in there. So what I can do is I can factor out the pi sub 1. So I have 1 plus, then I have my exponential function evaluated at a quantity plus dot 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 plus the exponential function evaluated at a quantity is equal to 1. I can put this together in a summation then, bring it over to the right side, and now I have an expression for just pi 1 itself in terms of these explain it in terms of the <clears throat> excuse me in terms of the regression parameters in our explanatory variable using this expression then I can come back 
put that in there and so that now I have a way to get pi sub j for j equal 2 to capital J. So this then is how we can find pi 1, pi 2, down to pi sub capital J in terms of our explanatory variable and our regression parameter. Do note that on a test before I've actually had have asked students to actually show this uh, work here. So then how do we find estimates of these regression parameters, these betas? Well, we use maximum likelihood estimation to do it. What do we do? Well, we go back to our multinomial likelihood function that we've seen before. Wherever I have a pi 1, a pi 2, down to pi sub capital J, I put in the corresponding expression that we just see here. I use iterative numerical procedures then to maximize that likelihood function. Once I've found the maximum, then I can find then the corresponding maximum likelihood estimates for the, um, uh, or the, the maximum of that likelihood function then corresponds to where my maximum likelihood estimators are. Now in R, as in the software package, uh, there are two main functions that people use to estimate these multinomial regression models. And, and before I forget, I should mention one other little thing, is that um, sometimes people will call these baseline category legit models as well for reasons that we've um, uh, just discussed when we first introduced these models. Okay, to find these maximum like, uh, to find, uh, to estimate these models, I should say, uh, we can use the multinome function that's in the NNET package, which stands for Neural Networks. Basically, in the end, a multinomial regression model, or the author, I should say, of the NNET package, does some relationships with a uh, neural network to multinomial regression. That's how the model is actually estimated. This package here is in the default installation of R, so you do not need to install it yourself. Another function that's used is something called VGLM, which comes from the VGAM package. The V stands for vector. One can think of these multinomial regression models as part of a larger class of overall models called vector generalized linear models, and so that's where the name of this function comes from. Here are some notes about these functions. What I will tell you before we get into these notes is that neither other functions are as good as um, I would like. And so I'm going to briefly talk about some advantages and disadvantages to them. Okay, so the multinome function itself. This is probably the most widely used way that these kinds of models are actually estimated. The estimation algorithm that's being used um, is not necessarily uh, fast. Um, it can take a lot of iterations to come up with these uh, maximum likelihood estimates for our regression parameters. And, um, and to some respect, too, I wish the author of the package would have used a larger value for the maximum number of iterations using its max it argument and also a smaller convergence criteria to decide on convergence. The reason why I said that is that I've actually at times estimated a model to exactly the same data using multinome versus VGLM and actually found that the multinome probably could have went a few more iterations before it itself declared um, convergence in order to match what VGLM gave. And I actually even verified that indeed VGLM produced a larger log likelihood function. Now, that being said, in the end, in most scenarios, even if that were to occur, there's not going to be um, a practical difference in the interpretation of your regression model. Profile likelihood ratio inference procedures, unfortunately, are not available here either through like a confident function that would um, where a method function would exist in the, the neural network uh, package um, or MC profile. MC profile doesn't work here. 
Now, walled inferences are available through using the confint function, um, but it only works with, let's say, one regression parameter at a time, as what we've seen before with, log with logistic regression. Instead, though, one can use the EM means package to do some nice stuff, to work with some more complicated expressions. Excuse me. Now, VGLM. This is a user-contributed package. Um, it's authored by a particular individual, and um, it has been around for some time. You will need to download it from CRAN to actually install it. Something that's very worrisome with the package, though, if you actually look inside the help, you come across this statement. This package is undergoing continuing, continual development and improvement. Therefore, users should treat everything as subject to change. When I see something like that, that makes me worried about using that package. And I've used this package for a number of years uh, for a, a few different, well, I shouldn't say a few, but for a number of different applications. And what I have found, unfortunately, corresponding to this statement is that the author of the package will sometimes change functions, sometimes will, uh, in terms of the um, how the function actually works, will change some of the syntax so that, let's say, if you wrote some code five years ago and try to use it now, it may not work anymore because the syntax has changed. Um, I, I've, I find that, that that is not a good way to do programming. Um, especially when you're programming for something that is meant for others to use. You need to have backward compatibility. And unfortunately, this doesn't always happen with this package. Profile Likert ratio intervals can be calculated for some simple regression parameters. So just like a beta, like a, a beta um, uh, 2, 1. For one at a time, you can use the confident function or the method function that's in the package uh, to do this. However, more complicated, um, you know, functions of these regression parameters, similar to what we saw with the logistic regression setting, um, you cannot do profile like a ratio intervals with them. The MC profile package does not work. Uh, the particular confident function here does not work for that. And also, unfortunately, the EM means function cannot be used uh, with uh, results from VGLM. So. As I said, neither function and corresponding package is as good as I would like. Um, I am here going to just focus in my notes on multinome. There will be times where I bring some stuff from VGLM, uh, but I'm going to focus here on multinome. Now, of course, whenever we do maximum likelihood estimation, you would want to have an estimated covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix is estimated in a similar way as what we've seen in the past. Okay, so let's take a look at an example so that we can apply this multinome function to estimate one of these models. This example actually comes from uh, some work that I did uh, with my uh, co-author here, Tom Logan. And we were working with a researcher from a Department of Grain Science at Kansas State University. And this researcher wanted to come up with an automated way to determine the quality of a wheat kernel after it's been harvested. And what I mean by automated way, um, what I mean is that Rather than, let's say, having a human actually look at a wheat kernel and decide its, its quality, this automated system would do that automatically. <laughs> That's why it's an automated system. And so there are three types of wheat kernels that we are going to be using here. Healthy, sprout, sprout or scab. Healthy is the most desirable. Everything is great about that kernel or that seed you could say sprout basically means okay this kernel now has sprouted because it is a seed and this is less desirable than having a healthy wheat kernel uh, sprouts have less reduced weight 
end up with poor flower quality. Something that's also less desirable than healthy is a scab kernel. The scab comes from plants that have been infected by a disease and have various undesirable qualities associated with them, especially with regards to their appearance. And so here, here's a publication from Kansas State University that shows some wheat kernels here. And when you see some like white, chalky, chalky kind of wheat kernels, those are the ones that um, are of this scab classification, this type. Okay, so to test out this new automated system, what this researcher decided to do was take a sample of 275 wheat kernels and have them all classified by human examination first. Then the researcher had some of these automated, uh, I had, had this automated system take some measurements on each of the wheat kernels, such as its density, hardness, size, weight, and moisture content. Along with that, we know that if the, we know whether the wheat kernel came from soft red winter wheat or hard red winter wheat. So using these as my explanatory variables, what I would like to do is estimate a multinomial regression model that helps to predict healthy sprout or scab. And we can then look with our model uh, in terms of look at the estimated model to interpret the effect that density has on these categories, to interpret the effect that the type of wheat, hard or soft red winter wheat, the class, class of it, what kind of effect that has on, on these three kernel types. Okay, so my corresponding data is in a file called wheat.csv, comma delimited file. I read that into R the usual way. Here's what the first three kernels in the data set look like. So the first row of my data frame says we had a hard red winter wheat kernel. Density was about 1.35. Moisture content was 12.0. Uh, and by human inspection, it was a healthy kernel. The last kernel in the data set was soft red winter wheat. It was a scab kernel. Okay, so what we have here then next is a plot and my corresponding code is in my program. Um, at least for st students in my course, um, I wouldn't expect uh, students to be able to reproduce this particular plot on a test, but you would maybe need to interpret it. This is a parallel coordinate plot. This might be my most favorite type of plot out there because it's a great plot that to allow you to understand the relationships between multiple variables at the same time. So in this particular case, you can see that I have seven different items on the X axis. And this basically means I'm looking at a seven dimensional plot. Okay. so. Again, on the x-axis, we have uh, particular variables of interest. What a parallel coordinate plot does is you can think of it this way. Suppose for the density values for all my values in my data set, I look at all of them and I find the, dense, the kernel with the smallest density and I plot it there. I find the kernel with the next smallest density, I plot it there. And the one with the largest density, I plot it there. And one way to think about it is, let's say, it rescales the density values to be on a 0 to 1 scale. So we can see that, indeed, that there is some distance here. So, you know, maybe perhaps that this second smallest uh, kernel in terms of density was maybe about, I'm sorry, it's, yeah, the second smallest kernel in density was about maybe 5 to 10% larger than the smallest one overall. Then do exactly the same thing for hardness. Find the smallest hardness value kernel, find the largest kernel in terms of um, hardness, and then plot everything in a relative, relatively um, uh, in between. And so do this for all the variables in the data frame. 
next actually connect the dots here corresponding to the kernels across the different variables. So for example here, the kernel with the smallest uh, hardness also had a relatively small density as well. It had kind of a middle value for a uh, size and so on. And so again, what this allows one to see is um, understand these kernels, in this particular case, the kernels um, helps them under, helps you understand it's essentially distribution per variable. It helps you understand relative values per kernel, and it allows you to see what happens over multiple variables as well to help look for trends. And so what we see here is I've color coded the different kernel types so that we can try to see trends. And so what we see here, take a look at scale. Notice how oh, a lot of the kernels that have low density are scab. Similar with the weight, similar with the size. And so when we see something like that, we think, oh, this might be helpful then for that multinomial regression model. It should be able to pick that up, that kind of a trend. Notice also here with respect to the healthy kernels, they tend to have larger density values. Again, the multinomial regression model should be able to pick that up and we'll, we will actually see that. Okay, so this is a parallel coordinates plot, a very useful plot to examine first before you proceed with a more formal data analysis. Here's my multinomial regression model that I'm going to be interested in. The log of pi sub j divided by pi sub 1 is equal to my intercept term, then my first explanatory variable, this will be the class soft red winter wheat, hard red winter wheat, so I'll have to have an indicator variable for that. And I keep on going to the very last variable, which I believe is moisture content. Notice the j there. Notice how I put j equal 2 and 3, because we have three categories that we're interested in. Now, what exactly should j equal 1, 2, and 3 represent in terms of these three categories? Well, the way that R approaches, this is in a very similar way to what we've seen in the past for a factor. If I were to say levels, wheat, dollar sign, type, what's going to happen is this. It's going to put these in alphabetical order, as we've seen. And so what this means is j equal 1 is going to be healthy, j equal 2 is going to be scab, j equal 3 is going to be sprout. So let's go ahead and estimate this model. I'm going to use, again, the multinome function that's in the NNET package. And while this package is automatically installed by default, in order to access functions inside of it, I do need to use the library function first. It's just a way that this is set up by default for R. Then to use this function, I'm going to put the results into mod.fit. Then I say multinome formula equal. Here's my response variable type that contains the healthy scab and sprout. Then I write out my five explanatory variables right there, and then simply data equal wheat. So very simple to use. We see a little bit of information given by default about the iterative numerical procedure. The key thing for you to examine here, it says converged. And if I were to look at now, let's say the summary of what's inside of mod.fit, here's what we get somewhat a, of a similar set of output than, than what we got before with the GLM function and summary with that, but there are some differences. So if we look here, we have scab, we have sprout. You don't see healthy there because remember healthy is the baseline category. And so what we have here then is beta hat, and this is two zero, beta hat three zero, the intercept. If 
I look at density here, we have beta hat to two, we have beta hat uh, to three. We have a set of standard errors. So for example, right here would be the square root of the estimated variance of beta hat to two. Okay, so with this uh, output, then I can state then my corresponding estimated multinomial regression model. Here it is. So notice here again is beta hat to zero. Here's beta hat to two. Remember, scab is two, healthy is one. Then I also need to state the part of the model for sprout. Sprout is three, healthy is one. Here is, for example, beta hat two, three. I'm sorry, beta hat three, two. It can obviously be easy to mix up the ordering there. Let me just make sure that I got this right. In fact, I did not get it right. That should have been a three, two there. Okay, so there's my estimated, estimated multinomial regression model. Um, now note here, let me actually come back up. Remember, class is for soft red winter wheat and hard red winter wheat. And so the way that R approaches this is hard red winter wheat starts with an H, soft red winter wheat starts with an S. So therefore, R is going to do that set first level equal to zero. Um, um, uh, way of doing this and just like what we've seen before and automatically created an indicator variable that's equal to a one for soft red wind wheat zero for hard red wind wheat okay so we have now the estimated model and what we can do is apply very similar uh, sets of our code to what we've done before to further investigate aspects of this model. Even though we haven't ever seen the results from a multinomial regression model, we can take what we've done before with the GLM function and try to apply it here. Most of the time it works. There will be some times where it doesn't work quite the way that we expect. So for example, let's say we wanted to perform a wall test for beta sub jr, meaning we wanted to do something like this there's my null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is not equal to zero. If you notice here, something that is different from the, the using summary uh, for um, logistic regression. If you notice here, we don't see those corresponding wall tests. Well, why? Well, the reason being is because if I want to test the density variable, I can't just test one beta at the, at the same time. I would need to test two betas because it's represented by two separate terms in my model. So that's why you don't see those kinds of um, tests in the output like you would normally. Uh, if you wanted to perform the test, usually you wouldn't. But if you did, here's some code that you can look at to see how that is done. So instead, what we would like to be able to do is do a test for all the betas that represent a particular variable in our model. So if I did, uh, if I wanted to do this particular test, let's say um, beta HO's beta two two is equal to beta three two is equal to zero. This would be for my density variable. My alternative hypothesis would be, I'll just write it out really easy, not all zero. And I can use our usual methods like ANOVA, capital ANOVA and little ANOVA of functions to perform Likert ratio tests that gives me this joint test here. If I use the capital ANOVA function or the ANOVA function with a capital A out in front, here's where we what we get. So for the density variable, my negative two log lambda statistic is 90.56 using a chi-square two distribution approximation with it. The reason why it's two is because I have two betas here. I get a p-value that's extremely small. So therefore, I reject HO. And what this means is that it looks like density is important for predicting these categories. Also, look what else is important. Well, we have hardness, marginal importance, weight. You know, there's a lot. Um, there's strong evidence that weight is important. But with the other variables, we don't see it as much. 
And so what we can do is go back to our parallel coordinates plot and see and relate this to there. Look at density. Remember how I highlighted that density part there? Well, the reason um, our likelihood ratio tests had such a small p-value is because exactly what we see in this plot here. Uh, we see some differentiation amongst those uh, categories. Okay, so how can we estimate the probability of healthy for the first observation? Well, what we can do is we can go back to our, our original equations. Uh, remember, I went through that quick little derivation for what pi 1 would be, what pi 2 would be, what uh, pi up to capital J would be. We can apply those equations here, but just put hats on top of the betas. And if we did that with for pi hat healthy, we get an estimated probability of 0.8552. Do note for students who are taking my course, sometimes I will actually ask students to do something like this on a test. Now, there are actually, as you might expect, easier ways to do these calculations. Similar to what we had when we were doing logistic regression, we can use the predict function to do these calculations for us automatically. Here's how. Predict object equal mod.fit. For my new data argument, I can specify, well, what are my explanatory variable values that I want to estimate the pies at? Um, just to make things simple here, how about we just simply take the first observation in my wheat data set, take those values in my explanatory variables and apply them here. And then I need to say type equal probs to say I want my probabilities. And so here are my estimated probabilities for each of the categories. Now we can see here that for the healthy category, that has a much, much higher estimated probability than all the other categories. So because of that, you might say, hmm, if I had to classify this observation as healthy scab or sprout, I would do healthy. And if you did that, then you would actually be correct here because through human inspection, this was classified as healthy. Now, this then gets into number four here, is that, well, how can we determine a classification for the kernels? Well, what one could do is simply look at the probability that is the highest amongst those three probabilities that are being calculated. Look at the estimated probabilities. Look at the one that has the highest estimated probabilities. I should be more precise. And then the one that, uh, the, the category uh, that has the highest estimated probability that corresponds to what the predicted classification would be for that kind of a kernel. And to do that automatically, you can change the type argument to class. Now, the purpose of our class here is not then to evaluate how good those classifications are. Uh, this rather would be something that would be discussed in a multivariate analysis course or a statistical learning course, typically in a statistics program. Here are some other parts here. On your own, take a look at, well, what does mod.fit dollar sign fitted dot values give you? Also, think about, well, how would you get the estimated covariance matrix? Maybe think about what you've learned in the past that could be applied here to get that estimated covariance matrix out of R. And lastly, think about, well, how could you include some type of transformation of an explanatory variable in the model? How? Do it exactly the same way that we've done it before with GLM. Okay, so we have these estimated probabilities. And you might be wondering, well, how about we do some kind of confidence intervals for the pi sub j's? After all, when we were doing logistic regression, we were very interested in a confidence interval for pi itself, the probability of success. How about we do that here? Well, this is unfortunately a little bit more complicated now with this kind of a model. Both the n net and vgam packages do not provide tools to get the confidence intervals for each of the pies. Here's the reason why. Suppose you had some confidence intervals that look like this. Oh, let's say 0.2 is less than pi 1 is less than um, 0.5. 
Maybe I have, let's say, uh, 0.4 is less than pi 2 is less than 0.6. And then I have maybe 0.3 is less than pi 3 is less than 0.7. So these three intervals give us a range for a particular set of explanatory variables, give us a range for the pi's. And if we looked at the maximum possible values, add them up, notice they are greater than 1. Well, of course, it, pi 1 plus pi 2 plus pi 3 must be equal to 1. And so because of that, doing, let's say, one at a time confidence intervals like this um, is somewhat questionable to do. And that's why the authors of these packages did not include that ability to calculate those intervals. So what one would need to do is actually form a confidence region where you take into account all three of these corresponding probabilities and find a region rather than a single interval that would fit on a one numerical, um, on, on let's say on one number line, you could say, to put it uh, in, a, in, a, in a simple way. And so you would need to find a region. There aren't easy ways to automatically do this in R. And so because of that, uh, we will not discuss that here. So given, uh, the re given then that, you know, the alternative is to not use confidence intervals at all. Um, and there is some uh, justification for that. But I think, I guess it's, it's, it's better than nothing to use one at a time confidence intervals. And so we can actually end up calculating them in R using the EM means package. So let's talk about how to do that. So I can use the EM means function in a similar way to what we've done before, but now there are unfortunately some changes. This represents some of the quirkiness of using this package. I put my object from resulting from my model fit in the object argument. And then for my specs argument, normally we always put our um, explanatory variables now, instead, we put our response variable, type. We have a new argument called mode, and this just allows you to say, hey, I want my estimated probabilities. And then I can still say at, what are my explanatory variable values? Again, to make things simple, I'm just going to use the first observation in my data frame for that. If I wanted to look at multiple values of, let's say, dense, density, multiple, multiple values of hardness, and so on, if I had wanted to do that, I would need to use a, a general list again, like what we did when we were working with a logistic regression model. So here are my corresponding results. These are the same estimated probabilities that we had before, but now we have these one at a time 95% confidence intervals. Okay. Uh, oh, one other thing, sorry, I forgot to say we need to look at the summary function with the results from calc.prob where we actually specify the degrees of freedom as inf for infinity. The reason being, and I'm not for sure, I, or I should say I wish EM means wouldn't do this, it will actually use a T distribution with a particular number of degrees of freedom rather than, since these are walled intervals, it should use a standard normal distribution and so using the relationship between a T and a standard normal, you know, T distribution has infinite number of degrees of freedom, corresponds to a standard normal. That's why I use inf there, and I did specify 95% intervals. Okay. Now, when there is more than one explanatory variable in our model, it can be a little bit difficult to do a graphical portrayal of what this model is saying. Um, so because of that, I decided to look at a new model that only has density. Remember how we saw that density was important. And so I estimated a new model, my code is in my program, that just has density. Then similar to what we've done in the past, I've used the curve function to actually plot the model. Make sure you take a look at the corresponding code to do that. Here's the corresponding plot then. And so what we see is that the lower 
density values tend to have high probability for scab. Go back to our parallel coordinate plot, what we have found before for that. We saw that the kernels that were scab tend to have low density. The kernels that tend to have high density were healthy. And we see that here with respect to our estimated model. Now, in this plot here, do note that I draw these lines from the minimum value to the maximum value that was actually observed in the data set corresponding to one of these kernel types. The reason why I chose that is so I don't extrapolate beyond the range of my observed data. Okay. Now, you could do a plot like this if you have more than one explanatory variable in your model. You would just need to say, Okay, we're going to set my hardness to this particular value. I'm going to set my moisture content to this particular value and so on and do the same kind of plot. Um, I just chose not to do that so that we can just simply see relative to density alone since it's such an important variable. I decided to do it this way instead. Okay, so that concludes this introduction to multinomial regression models.